Bob Wheeler, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Well, thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to chat with you uh, for many reasons. You have some really great, um, you know, you have great background, you have great experience uh, to, to share with listeners, and, and we're going to unpack um, elements of leadership and how it connects with decision making. But you also, you know, you've done something that's on my personal bucket list I would just love to do. And, and you're going to tell us a little bit about, about your experience at Everest um, and some, some of the principles and, and lessons learned from that and how that can apply back to our organizations as well. So I'm, I'm super excited to have that conversation. As we get started, I wanted to share Bob's bio with everybody. As a man of true integrity with infectious energy, Bob Wheeler's crusade for personal growth has cross-pollinated with his accounting practice to create a new approach to personal finances. His passion is to help others gain insights about how their emotions trigger financial decisions. Combining finances with behaviors, Bob explores his personal concept of creating a healthy relationship with money in his book, The Money Nerve, Navigating the Emotions of Money, his online course, Mastering the Emotions of Money, and his podcast, Money You Should Ask. While strengthening his accounting practice, Bob has simultaneously pursued his love of satire and ventured into the realm of stand-up comedy. From his 30 years of helping clients, Bob has distilled a connection of warmth, humor, information, motivation, and budgeting directives that he offers to anyone with financial concerns. He is also currently the CFO for the world-famous comedy store. Bob's world travels have led him to high altitudes. He's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, ascended to the Mount Everest Base Camp, and hiked several smaller mountains in between. With charm and humor, his experiences on the road, in the office, or running a Greek marathon feed his wit as a stand-up comic and financial motivator. What an eclectic uh, set of like experiences and interests and hobbies uh, and expertise. Uh, so much fun. Uh, before we launch into the conversation, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or, or personal context? No, I, I already think I have a lot to live up to, so I'm, uh, I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. So, I, I mean, I have to ask just to start, um, what got you into hiking? Kilimanjaro, amazing. Um, going up to base camp, amazing. And I'm sure you've done so many other um, hikes and summits as well. What got you into all that? And, and maybe we can launch the conversation about leadership and decision-making um, by tying in some principles and lessons learned from yeah, those Yeah, absolutely. Hikes. Absolutely. I, for me, uh, getting out in nature is a great way to get grounded. Uh, it reminds me sometimes how small I am <laughs> in the bigger picture. And so for me, just getting out with nature, uh, when you're hiking, you can be with a group of people, but you're also on your own. And it's, it's just, for me, it's very grounding. But like, I actually remember one time when I was uh, when we were hiking to Everest and I decided I didn't want to take this extra day trip to this other mountain. I turned around by myself and all of a sudden I'm lost <laughs> and there's nobody around to sort of guide me back to my, my, my camp. And uh, yeah, there was a little terror there for about 30 minutes, but you know, ultimately I found my way back. Mountains for me are just grounding and it reminds me of the importance of nature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I love the connection to nature, the earth around us, the calming elements, the, the opportunity for reflection uh, and to center ourselves, um, mindfulness practice, you know, all of that, I think uh, we can find through our connection with nature, whether it's through hiking and going up mountains or kayaking or, you know, whatever, um, yeah. just walking your dog around the park. There's, there's so many opportunities for that. And I think it's a great reminder to us when we're, uh, really in the hustle and bustle of the day, um, in the, in the daily grind of just trying to get stuff done in the concrete jungle, you know, like get out, go experience the beauties of the world. Um, because there are many, and you usually don't have to travel all that far to even find them. Um, if you're just willing to prioritize that as part of your, your daily routine or weekly routine. Absolutely. I, I just think we get so caught up in getting things done and we forget we're part of the world. <laughs> and so it's just good to take a break and participate in it. Yeah. And I, I've never done, I, I've hiked and I've summited some much smaller mountains. Um, but I've never done anything as even remotely close to as extensive as what you've done. Um, but one small kind of corollary in my mind is when I was younger, I, I did a lot of biking and there's a lot of, um, again, you're there with people. Um, you're, you're there with a team of other bikers, but you're, it's also a very personal individual thing and you have to work through your own 
you know, it's, it's your own mental, uh, it, it's the physical exercise of, of course, but it's more mental than anything. Uh, and just learning, learning the resilience of it and kind of, even though you're with other bikers, like that self-isolation of it while you're on the road, um, you know, I, I imagine that's somewhat similar to, to what you've experienced in some of those high altitude types of um, hikes. Absolutely. It's, I would say it's, it's the majority of it's mental. And a lot of people like, oh, you, could, you know, how do you, you know, is it about the hiking or getting in shape? And it's actually about the mental awareness and the mental mindfulness to be able to stay on top of things. Uh, I, you know, you're talking about leadership and it makes me think of, um, you know, in hiking, you've got to be quick thinker uh, because sometimes you have to solve things. And what happened to me on Everest that I, that I like to share, because I think it's so relevant to, to leadership and how we uh, work in the world is that we, we hiked the first day. I had a team of friends and we hiked it the first day. And at the end of the day, everybody said, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought. Um, let's quit. And I, I'm like, we can't quit. Um, you know, I uh, just spent like $5,000 and we can't do that. Like, what are we going to do? And everybody's like, no, this was incredibly hard. And we hadn't even started really on the trail. So I quickly said, how about this? Let's just, let's just hike for the next hour. And at the end of the hour, let's see if we want to continue hiking. And if we want to turn back, we'll turn back. And if we want to go another hour, we'll go another hour. And so what we ended up doing the first five days, we hiked multiple one hour hikes. And what that did was it, the baby steps element, the digestible amount of, I can hike an hour, uh, was much easier than looking at the mountain and saying, oh my God, we have to get there in 10 days and we have to climb over that one and we have to go down. No, 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 no. Let's just focus. Let's just get to that little bridge. Let's just get to that little rock. And and, and that's how we did it. And by the fifth day, we started doing two hours and four hours and we would just renegotiate and, and then just focus on that little bit of time instead of trying to do the whole mountain. And, and I think in leadership, sometimes we get so many things thrown at us, so many projects, we don't know where to start. And if we can just take it in baby steps and say, well, I'll start in this corner and then I'll go to this. It actually becomes much more manageable and less overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, in, in leadership, we're, we're constantly trying to put out fires, we're managing our people, we're bringing on new team members, trying to onboard them and upskill them and help them to be productive. We're strategic planning. Like there's all these things. There's a big long list of things you got to do daily. And then you're hopefully look trying to look into the future and look around the corner and try to anticipate what might be coming at you. And I think particularly with like, say, a five-year strategic plan. I mean, that can be incredibly overwhelming because it's aspirational. It's things that you're going to be working towards over the course of many years. And some of those things you may never actually get to, but you're, it's such a huge thing that unless you're able to break it into smaller pieces, both for you personally, but also for your team members to help them recognize the intermediate steps along the way to recognize um, and to, to experience and recognize the small wins along the way to build confidence and to build momentum and motivation. Unless you can do that, most people don't have the, the wherewithal, the perseverance, the internal fortitude to just continue carrying on um, towards this hugely distant, overwhelming goal, unless they have those intermediate steps. So I, so I love that. And I, I, I think the same thing from my experience with biking or even my lesser experience with hiking is, yeah, you, you're, you're looking up the road and there's a landmark and you're shooting for that and you're exhausted and you've been biking all day and you know, you don't know how much further you can actually go. Okay. So I'm just going to get to that point. And that may be it. I may collapse in exhaustion, but I'm going to get to that point. And then you get to that point and you choose the next point. And a lot of times in business and leadership and working with our teams, it's the same thing. And people don't know what their potential is. They, they, they have mental, um, they have, they have a mental under model of like what their capacity is. And it's usually, way lower than what they can actually do. And so if they can't get out of their own way and learn to set aside their own assumptions about their capabilities, they're never going to be able to achieve that full potential. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think in that baby step piece, I, uh, my other analogy is A to Z. You know, so many people are trying to get from A to Z and I'm just focusing on A to B and A and B to C. Uh, when, whether you're doing personal goals or business goals, 
a lot of times people set the final goal and they don't think about all the pieces to get them there. And so they're just focused on that and they're not building the foundation. And what I found is when I can actually break a goal down, you know, somebody says, oh, I want to travel to Paris or I want to buy a house. And they're just like, that's my goal, buy a house. Okay, wait, stop. How much are you going to save each week? Where are you going to cut back spending? How are we? Oh, the details. Oh, <laughs> oh, those, right? And so slowing it down and looking A to B, B to C, we start to fill in the pieces that then again, it makes it more manageable. Oh, right. I have to save money. I need to figure out a certain amount, uh, whatever those goals are. I need to hire 10 more people. Uh, well, let me hire two at a time so that I can train those two. Then, and then they'll be able to help the next two instead of just, oh, do it all at once and trying to just get to this Z, um, just getting to the top. Yeah, so certainly anything uh, financial, um, it, it follows the same principle, right? Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about um, budgeting and department budgets and finances, um, we're lo looking how to launch or sustain new initiatives, new programs, um, <clears throat> approaches to developing our employees, whatever. Um, all of that takes resources, it takes time, it takes money, and it can seem overwhelming if Let's say, for example, we have, you know, we have a big team and we're, we're going to invest a quarter of a million dollars this year into um, upskilling and, and, and uh, personnel development um, to, to help our people develop the, still, the skills, the competencies, the capabilities needed for the future, right? That's a huge amount of money, especially if you're a you know, small to medium-sized organization. Um, so how, you know, just having that big, that big thing at the end of, of the runway saying, you know, this big amount that we're committing, um, that's, that's going to be a harder sell to, to the C-suite, you know, to, to the individuals who have to approve it. It's going to be harder for you to try to figure out like what you're going to, how you're going to accomplish that. And so you just break it down into like individual, uh, efforts, individual events, individual, um, uh, components of the bigger, picture. And as you do that, it becomes much more, uh, it becomes scalable, it becomes doable, and people can wrap their minds around the different components much better than when it's just, we're throwing out these big, huge numbers. So again, whether we're talking financially, breaking it down, if we're talking about the budget and breaking it down, if we're talking about, you know, goals and breaking them down for any, in any way, I think all of that uh, comes back into play. Now, I know you, you do a lot um, with, the connection between emotions and goal setting and decision making. Tell us a little bit more about that and how you work with clients as they try to navigate the, those complexities of like these big life goals that they have. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first places I always start is with honest budgeting. <laughs> and I, I say honest budgeting because a lot of times I work with clients uh, and they'll leave out components that are important. Uh, you know, if they've got a shopping addiction or a food addiction or whatever kind of addiction, if they're not including those in the numbers and we keep coming up short, uh, sort of not helpful. So when I work with people, I say, listen, I'm not judging where the money's going. I just need to know where it's going so that we can actually look at things and then make different choices or, or not. But so you know, for me, that's a real important component. You know, I have, I used to have an office manager uh, and I opened her drawer and she had 40 candy bars in her drawer. And I said, I thought you were trying to, you told me you're trying to cut back and this, that. She goes, well, if it's in my office drawer, it doesn't count, right? It only counts when I leave the office. And it's the same thing with money. We have to count it because it actually does count. And so that's a real important component. And then what I do is once we start to set some goals, um, I think it's important to list out goals that you want short-term, intermediate, and long-term, right? Because I might want something in the next six months. I might want something uh, a year or two from now, and I might want something in retirement. And so it's important to just, and I usually have people just brainstorm. I want this, I want this, I want that. And then take a real good look at it. And, oh, that's for my parents. Oh, that's to make my friend happy. And, and it's sort of eliminate the things that are really not actually what we want, but what we think everybody else wants us to want. And, and then to just start getting really clear with what are the things that I want in my life? And then are the choices that I'm making today in alignment with what I say that I want. So if I say that I'm saving towards a house and I'm spending 500 bucks a week on dinners out or little mini vacations every other weekend, 
maybe I'm not in alignment with what I say that I want. So if we can get aware and conscious and be more intentional in the steps that we're doing now, it will lead us to those steps later that get us what we want. Yeah, I, th I think that's excellent. All extremely good advice. And, and where does the, the emotional component come in? Uh, wh whether we're talking about goal setting generally, um, the connection between goal setting and our actual behaviors, uh, our motivation, um, you know, we, most people set some sort of new year's resolution and we right. have all, we have all these uh, intentions, these good intentions. Mm -hmm. And then most people by the second week of January that, you know, it's kind of already faded. Um, so how do we, how do we like start off with good intentions and then sustain that over time and say, sustain the emotional energy um, to allow us to continue. Yeah. So for me, the first thing is to get conscious of, of any self-sabotage, any stories, negative stories that are, that are, that are taking me out. So when I do a workshop and I've got a bunch of people in the room, I'll say to everybody, who wants to be rich? And everybody, oh, I want to be rich. You know, everybody's raising their hands. They can't get up fast enough. Oh, I want, I want to be rich. And then I'll follow up with the question, do you deserve it? And majority of the people, oh, oh, that question, right? So once we start to realize, oh, there's a story. I don't deserve to actually have the success. I'm going to go through the, I'm going to go through the motions, but deep down, I'm the exception to the rule. I can't have it. Uh, and so there are these self-defeating beliefs that if we're not aware of, it can really take us out. Now, I'll tell you a story. When I sat for my CPA exam um, the first time, I took a course uh, to prep me for the CPA exam. And the guy at the very beginning said, all right, we're going to be doing this course for the next 12 weeks. You're going to be expected to do all these things. But I want to say to you right now, if you don't believe you can pass the CPA exam, then you might as well go ahead and get your money back this week. Because if that's your belief, you are not going to pass the exam. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I know I'm not going to pass the exam, but I'm really hopeful if I take this course, it'll be enough to get me over. And sure enough, I didn't pass the exam. Even though, you know, some of my associates thought I was going to pass it quickly. I seem they, you know, I got credit for being smarter than a couple of my CPA fellows in the office, but I had a belief that said, not you. And so I had to do some work around that. And I remember so clearly that he made this comment. If you believe you can't, you will get to be right. And so for me, I've really got to get people to be aware of what are those stories that they've told themselves or that they took from their parents, that they took from their culture, that they took from their religious upbringing, whatever it is, bring it all into the mix, welcome it in, and then start asking if it's fact or fiction and start to let go of those stories that aren't serving. Yeah. And we all have those mental barriers uh, in, in our conception. And I, and I, you know, it's part of the natural process of, of growing up and maturing, sure. um, that we, we learn to, to grow into ourselves and we learn to understand ourselves. Um, some people are more inclined to continue pushing that and to try to, to move towards self-discovery and other people are more inclined to just kind of stay with their comfort zone. Um, and I guess, you know, what, what I'm hearing you say, and certainly what I would say is there's, there's huge benefit in continuing to strive, to push, um, you know, challenge your assumptions, challenge, it doesn't need to, it doesn't mean you need to jettison everything that you've ever valued, right. um, you know, but it does mean that you challenge assumptions and that you challenge tradition. You don't do things just because, just because that's what other people expected or ju just because that's the way it's always been done. Um, that may not be the best thing moving forward for you, for your family, for your team at work. And so if you're willing to do that, to, 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 to be inquisitive and to challenge and to continually grow, then I think we, we can naturally um, create, you know, a cognitive uh, framing within ourselves to push towards continual development, that we can uh, find the motivation to get, you know, that, to, to get past the ebbs and flows of our emotional state. We all have them. We have highs, we have lows. Uh, we have times that we're super energized. We have other times that we're just don't want to even get out of bed in the morning. And that's, that's normal. Like everyone deals with that. And so 
we, but we can learn how to navigate it. We can learn how to be resilient within that context. And we can learn how to make decisions that are better for our long-term outlook instead of making decisions that might provide immediate um, gratification, immediate satisfaction, but ultimately can undermine our long-term sustainable success. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm reminded of a story as you were, as you were, we were talking, I, it, it's so important to know who you are, right? To get to know the nuances of yourself. That makes me uncomfortable. This makes me comfortable. I'm comfortable in my power. A lot of people in leadership positions aren't comfortable in their power or don't know their power. I took a leadership workshop. Uh, it was a three-day workshop. And I went in, of course, saying, well, I'm not a leader, but I'd like to learn to be a better leader. And what happened was over the course of this weekend, we were asked to do things. And if you're not happy with this, then step up and make, you'll skip lunch and you'll do this and all these things that were happening. And the whole time my story was, well, I'm not a leader. And what I didn't know was that they had taped the entire weekend so that we actually got to see ourselves in action, unaware that we were being taped. And at the end of the weekend, I ended up getting some awards for being a leader. And I had like spearheaded this whole project that everybody wanted to wrap and wrap up. And I looked at that and went, that doesn't match my story. Wow, this is really interesting. And that was really helpful to me because I was uncomfortable with leadership and uncomfortable with power, even though a lot of people just gave it to me anyway. Um, I had to learn to be comfortable with the power dynamic and being comfortable with saying, okay, I'm in charge and not everybody's going to like it. Um, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to hold space for everybody as best I can. Um, and I'm going to be okay with stepping into this power position. Um, and not even, a, I don't want to say power position. There's a power dynamic that goes with leadership and to just have that awareness, um, allows me to be more compassionate and more open and holding space for other people. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, Bob, I, this has been a super fun and fascinating conversation. And I recognize we're even already getting close to the end of our time together. Uh, I, I figure we could probably continue uh, along this path for a long time and perhaps I can have you back on another time to continue. But before we close today, yeah. I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about the work that you're doing, and then give us the final word on the topic, you know, leadership, decision-making, resilience. Um, give us the final word for today. Absolutely. So people can find me at The Money Nerve, N-E-R-V-E. -E. I'm a nerd, but it's The Money Nerve. And you can check out my podcast. Uh, we've got uh, Money You Should Ask podcast, Mastering the Emotions of Money, which is a, is a course to help people get conscious of their, their emotional ties to their, to their finances and to their life goals. We also do a uh, every other week money and vision group that is open to people to come in and people to share what's going on with themselves. There's great blogs. People can reach out to me via email. Happy to help anybody. What I would say to people out there that are looking to be in leadership, I think one of the most important things for me was to understand uh, the power dynamic, that the power that I had as, as a leader. And that I also, I discovered that sometimes people wouldn't share information with me uh, because I was the leader. So I'm like, why isn't everybody telling me this? Uh, I, I'm very open and I'm, I welcome comments and people would say, well, you know, Bob, you're the boss. You can fire people. And I've found this in several organizations that I've, I've headed that when you're at the top, not everybody's going to give you information. And so you have to, for me, you don't have to do anything, but I think it's really imperative that you understand this so that you can find ways to let people feel comfortable giving you feedback so that you can actually be an effective leader and, and, and really hold space. So I think the biggest message to me, whether you're a leader, whether you're trying to get your life in order, is to be really curious. Get really curious, find everything interesting, and keep exploring. Keep exploring. Amen. I think that's that's a, a good lesson for anyone to take away. Um, if, if if nothing else, really stuck with you from our conversation for today. From today, Bob, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, to find out more about what Bob can do for you. Check out his books, check out his podcast, check out his courses. Uh, so many great resources. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. That you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.